A picture is worth a thousand words. Bringing animation alive with audio description. Hello, I'm Dr Amy Kavanagh and today I'm going to be talking to you about audio description in animated film and TV. Disability is part of the human experience. We all need to engage in the work to make our world accessible to everyone. Inclusion is a choice. That's a quote from Harbin Germer, a deaf-blind American activist. So, a little about me. I was born visually impaired with ocular albinism. My sight varies from low vision to no vision. I am registered sight impaired or blind, and I use a long white cane or I'm supported by guide dog Ava to aid my mobility. You will see guide dog Ava snoozing in the corner. I'm an activist, consultant, freelancer, and I use social media, the press, public speaking and campaigning to raise awareness of my experiences as a disabled person. I'm interested in issues varying from public transport, disabled women's rights, video game accessibility, the built environment and digital inclusion. But I'm here today to talk to you about animation. As a child with low vision, animation was more visually accessible to me. The combination of bright colours, exaggerated expressions, static backgrounds and consistent costumes made cartoons and animations easier to follow than other TV. I would study and memorise cartoons with my nose pressed up against our family TV. However, as an adult, I found myself increasingly excluded from animation, except by large mainstream studios. And that's because of audio description. So what is audio description? Well, it was first trialled in the 1960s using radio broadcasts and then later on audio cassettes that you would listen along to at the same time as watching a programme. It became mainstream from the 1980s on TV and in film. Audio description adds information about the actions taking place through narration in pauses between the dialogue. In the cinema, it's available via a headset or a radio pack, which you can see me wearing in that picture. But for film and TV at home, it's either a language setting or audio track on your TV service, DVD or streaming service. In this short video by the Royal National Institute for the Blind, blind and visually impaired people describe what AD means to them. Just watch a movie and close your eyes and you can't follow most movies with just listening. Be like, who's that? What's going on? Police lights flash on the front of the buyer's house as Officer Callahan stands outside with Joyce and Jonathan. Audio description is a description of the action that's going on in between the dialogue. Inside the dark house, Hopper walks down the hallway with a flashlight. For, for blind people, having that audio description, it becomes their eyes. I, I definitely say Orange is the New Black, Stranger Things and Game of Thrones have been my audio description highlights. Eleven closes her eyes. Elsewhere in the lab, the man from the photo sits at a table with a piece of paper. I can't see anything at all. So actually, I've never had audio description on life, as it were. So having it on TV is, is a great start. I use it for watching TV programmes, for films, films at home, films in the cinema. Theatre and cinema are my favourites. I use audio description when I go to football matches. A, a lot of those little subtleties in the way a person looks or something they do with their hands is actually a massive part of the story. Eleven steps out wearing the dress and wig. Lucas gives Dustin an impressed look as Mike gawks at her. If it's a gentle film, they'll have a, perhaps a gentler voice. Tilting his head. And in the action Good. films, they'll have a harder edge description. It drags dried growth and a piece of shepherd's suit across the floor, leaving behind a trail of blood. All that tension, a lot of that is based in, in seeing what's happening and getting a sense of the, the atmosphere. And, and that's really brought to life as well by audio description. I don't watch anything without audio description. I'm an absolute addict of audio description. I OD on AD. For more information... So as that video demonstrates, 
AD really opens up a whole world of entertainment to visually impaired and blind people. But unfortunately, in animation, it remains limited in its availability. It's really difficult to find audio descriptive animated content outside of Netflix or Disney. Unfortunately, this also means I can sort of limited in what I can show you today, also including for copyright reasons, but I hope you'll turn on your audio description track for a few of the recommendations I've included. Currently, Disney is still the best in the business. And as this AD Frozen advert shows, they really convey humour as well as action. Disney. A carrot-nosed coal-eyed snowman shuffles up to a purple flower peeping out of deep snow. Ooh. Hello. <laughs> he takes a deep sniff. <sighs> His nose lands on a frozen pond. A reindeer looks up and pants like a dog. <gasps> Seeing the reindeer slip on the ice, the snowman smiles and moves towards him. Though actually, he's running on the spot. The reindeer falls on his chin. The snowman uses his arm as a crutch. The reindeer paddles his front legs. Head over heels, the snowman crawls along the ice. The reindeer does the breaststroke. The snowman rolls his body, but flips onto his back. The reindeer's tongue sticks to the ice. The snowman hurls his head. Twig arm and reindeer lips tug at the carrot. The carrot flies off and lands in soft snow. The reindeer goes after it with Snowman and his body parts hanging on his tail. The snowman puts himself back together again and glumly contemplates his noseless state. The reindeer jams the carrot back in place and pants like a proud puppy. The snowman pats him with his stick thin arm, then goes to sneeze. He grabs his nose with both hands. His head shoots off. Frozen, coming this winter in 3D. The phrase, he glumly contemplates his noseless state, is just my absolute favourite. It really shows how, in a few words, you can so clearly describe the actions in such a charming way. So, what are the key principles of good audio descriptions? Starting out, it's important to say there are professional organisations that can work with you on scripts and recording your track. Personally, I recommend AI Media, who work with a lot of disabled people. Human voices are better than computer-generated, but computer-generated is cheaper and better than nothing. Think about audio description from the beginning. Are there enough pauses in the dialogue? Can you pause during scene setting to fit in a description? It's easier to build things accessible than fit it in at the end. The first thing to think about is a voice, tone and silence. Please think about the voice artist you want for your project. There is nothing more jarring than watching a Jane Austen with a Marvel voiceover like this. What accent do you want? Softer sounds? Deeper sounds? Feminine voices? Masculine voices? Think about what matches your project. Also, what language do you want your audio description in? For example, Bombay Rose, a celebrated uh, Indian film, uh, which is beautiful and hand-painted, has both Hindi and English AD. The tone of your audio description is like your visual palette for a blind viewer. So work with the voice artist to put the colour into the description, just as you have done it as an animator. Bad audio description can just ruin a programme for me. For example, Blood of Zeus, a TV series on Netflix, is a dark and brooding, brooding fantastical anime. There are dramatic scenes of fights between gods and monsters, but the audio description sounded like they were reading the phone book, and it made it boring, so I switched off. Audio description has a particularly important role in animation because of the frequent use of silence, or the choo choice not to include dialogue in animated films. Remember that my experience as a blind viewer is not a silence one, silent one if I'm using audio description, but this doesn't have to take away from the pathos or the tension. A fantastic example of this was If Anything Happens, I Love You, a short on Netflix. There's no dialogue, but the emotive and powerful audio description combined with the effective use of pauses, 
gave me the same pace, time and emotional reflection afforded a sighted viewer. It left me in floods of tears. Don't be afraid of audio describing silence. Done well, it can be just as impactful. Next, plot and character. When creating an animation, I'm pretty sure a lot of effort goes into character building, so don't leave blind viewers out of that experience. Tell me about clothes, hair, ethnicity, size, facial expressions. If you don't have space, why not issue a character description sheet alongside your animation? This is actually something done in theatre, where there's not time to go over a costume of an actor during the narrative of a play. If I was going to describe myself, I would say Amy is a plus-size white woman, she wears glasses and light makeup, she has a grey t-shirt and she's smiling. You can do this the first time or first appearance for a main character, but you don't have to repeat it unless key details change, like a radical haircut or a fancy new outfit. Having no description of a character can be really frustrating for me as a viewer. In Solar Opposites, an adult animation comedy, the pupa is always referred to just as the pupa and not described, ever. The pupa is this uh, character here on my slide. He's kind of a greeny yellow slug-like creature and he contains all the information and history of the planet Schlorp. But I had no idea what he looks like because he's never described. One of my partner's biggest pet peeves with audio description is that often it's full of spoilers. Now, sometimes this is unavoidable. The, ways, the way a pause might fall might mean that the action has to be described before it can take place. But there are some real basics to avoid, especially in character descriptions. Again, in Bombay Rose, the character of Mike is first described and introduced as a human trafficker. However, this is not evident from his initial interactions in the plot. He's certainly a bad dude, but it isn't until later that his motives are revealed. On to describing the medium. Animation comes in many forms, from CGI, stop motion to hand-drawn. You've chosen a medium for a reason, so let me, as a blind viewer, know what the art form is in the audio description. What are the lines and shapes and textures? Are there brush strokes, scratchy lines, round soft edges? Include your artistry in the voicing of your work. In If Anything Happens, I Love You, the colour palette is key to the story. The AD at the beginning explains that the animation is pencil drawn, sketched in grey. When the coloured items are introduced, they're described in detail, matching the significance they hold in the plot. It's important to describe when the medium changes. For example, in Canvas, an animated short on Disney, on Netflix, it starts by saying, a CGI animated short, but then neglects to say that the opening scene is actually painted onto a canvas, which is, you know, fairly relevant for the plot. Atmosphere and soundscapes. Although it's not really part of audio description, a soundscape and music used in animation can really support my understanding of the action. A well-placed sound effect or an impactful piece of music can shape the tone and emotion for me as a blind viewer. One short that did this really effectively was the collection of three shorts, uh, Modest Heroes by Ponak Short Films Theatre. Modest Heroes was one of the few examples of anime I could find with audio description. It doesn't seem that even Studio Ghibli has AD tracks in English. Anime is a medium which relies on sounds, excited expressions and powerful music would actually really lend itself to supporting audio description for blind audiences. In Modest Heroes, the final film Invisible has an immersive soundscape combined with impactful AD. For example, when the blind character gives the invisible man a pastry, the invisible man is described as scarfing it, which matches perfectly the hurried eating sound effect. AD is important in creating the atmosphere of your world, especially when that world is out of the ordinary. 
Think about describing the fantastical and strange. If your world contains shapes, environments, locations or characters which we don't experience in the real world, add the extra effort and detail to your description. For example, in Blood Zeus, the demons are described as animal-like, but not what animal. They could be bumblebees, squid or penguins, I have no idea. The majority of the examples that I've listed today include a disabled character. Whether it's parents experiencing mental health crisis, a wheelchair using senior citizen or a battle-scarred soldier, you will often find representations of disability in animation. So, it's important to make sure your representations are appropriate and your audio description uses the right language. In Bombay Rose, the character of Tipu is described as a deaf mute. This is not a term that is commonly used anymore, and most deaf or non-verbal people probably wouldn't use it. This is why it's really important to have disabled people as part of your creative team who can advise you on the language that's appropriate. Animation has also frequently been used as a medium to explore issues of disability. Recently, Ian, an animated short which has received considerable attention and awards, ironically, doesn't have audio description. Given that it focuses on the access barriers and negative attitudes experienced by a young disabled child, there is no version with audio description that I could find. Similarly, Out of Sight, again a much celebrated and powerful animation about the experiences of a young blind girl, is only available with AD added on by a YouTube volunteer, who recognised the irony of releasing the film without this vital accessibility feature. Thanks to this volunteer, I could fully enjoy Out of Sight. I really recommend it. It's a beautiful animation representing the way that you build a picture of the world as a blind person. If disability is the subject of your story, make sure it is accessible to disabled people. Hire disabled creatives and consultants to bring their lived experience to your project. Also, pay them. So, in conclusion... Audio description will open up your work to a wider audience. Make sure you think about it in your project from the start. Consider how your choices about audio description will convey your creative vision. And if you're representing disability, be inclusive. Because remember, blind people can enjoy animation too. Thank you very much for watching my talk. I will be in the questions lounge, um, but here are the ways that you can find out more about me. You can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Blonde Historian. You can work with me at amycavener.co.uk. And you can, of course, check out Guide Dog Ava on all of her social media platforms at Guide Dog Ava. Thank you very much. My name's Simon McCune. I'm an artist with uh, a long career in the uh, digital sector and uh, I'm also an academic and I'm also a disabled fine artist as well and I kind of use all these things together as part of my practice. Today though I want to talk about how disability can and perhaps should be used culturally. So this talk is a journey, it's stepping back to some of the earliest computer graphics in the UK. So following my degree in fine art, which was really adventurous technically, I used some of the, out there I was able to use some of the earliest 2D and 3D computing to do animation, to do 2D artworks and so on. And as a result, I went on to work in the medical sector in Cambridge uh, for a video company there. And then fairly quickly, I moved to Electric Image, who were one of the foundation kind of companies in, in, in the UK and also perhaps Europe in terms of being one of the earliest companies to generate computer graphics and computer graphics and special effects for film and television in the late 1980s. Electric Image was one of the foundation shareholders for Framestore, a huge company now. We used to share the, the same building with Framestore and Electric Image 
at Electric Image, I used to use some of the earliest computer graphics software, which is really interesting. It was developed by Robert Abel, who himself was a pioneer in visual effects, computer animation and interactive media. I do recommend you look at their work, Brilliance, which is which was developed for the Super Bowl, and it was all about the science of food in tin cans. It's an excellent piece of work. During my career, I produced all kinds of work for all kinds of companies across Europe and the Middle East, as well as, especially in the UK, for Channel 4, BBC and ITV. I left television, no, specifically to work in the, the games industry, and I became head of 3D and animation at Reflections, and now Reflections Interactive, who were based in Newcastle upon time. I worked there on unpublished and published games, and in particular, the multi-million unit selling game driver. This was a, a hugely exciting time to be involved in computer graphic production. The development of PlayStation, it done it, PlayStation 1 has only recently been launched, and interactive 3D software was really uh, started to develop, and so were the skills and practice of the artists involved. So Driver was a really seminal game, and it was really exciting to work on. It was groundbreaking because it was the first trackless based car game, so you could go anywhere, you could really explore the city. But beyond that, I was really interested in what I could bring to the game with my, um, with my knowledge of disability. So one of the early things that we were able to do was to implement probably the earliest or one of the earliest video subtitling systems within Driver. And that was really clever because not only did it help people who were deaf and like me, and, and of which there's 11 million people in the UK and over 37 million in, in the US, but it also helped people who, who perhaps had English as a second language as well. So it was about audience development. And if we fast forward now to, uh, to uh, Last of Us Part 2, we can put well, I'm absolutely blown away by the development in, in accessibility. You know, the, their, um, their approach to building access in from the onset is, is, is quite spectacular. And it's not just advances in subtitles, it's a whole lot more. And this approach, uh, one of the comments from that is that, that this approach just opens up games to, a new, to new audiences. And I think that's really critical. Do check out Steve Saylor's uh, Blind Gamer on YouTube. Do check out his review of Last of Us and how, how accessibility is built in. It's a really interesting uh, video blog. Hi, I'm Steve Saylor, I'm blind. And if you're wondering how I'm able to play video games if I'm blind, if you take a look at the video here, you can be able to see exactly what I see when I'm playing video games. Today is a very special episode. But real access isn't just about adopting tech and adopting approaches to playing tech. That's kind of like simply placing a ramp outside an arcade and not really, but it just allows people to get into the arcade, but it doesn't mean to say there'll be anything in the, in, in the arcade that culturally they will be interested in. And, and really it's access is about putting people's stories, the richness of people's stories, their journeys, and that of the whole of the society as a result into games. So access is a cultural issue as well. Joe, pa uh, Joe Parlock writing in Polygon said, it's much more common to talk about whether or not games are playable by those with disabilities than what the content in the games themselves say or imply about disabled individuals. And I think that's a really important thing. Let's um, think about what the content is. The Diversity in Games Report series, which concluded in 2018, so it's a little bit out of date, reveals how little and also how poorly disability is considered in games. Thinking about my own impairment, 
brittle bones. I can't remember it being portrayed well anywhere really. And we can see on the left that we've got uh, Joker from Mass Effect, and on the right we've got Samuel ja L. Jackson in the film Unbreakable. And these are based on kind of generic ideas of what somebody with brittle bones might be like. But of course they're not even slightly right. Jackson's enormous and um, uses a wheelchair badly. And he's also a maniac as well. And my argument is, is that these are very familiar lazy tropes. And the games industry uh, has a history of pertaining to disabled people badly, but so does cinema. And it's, I think it's very boring. I think it's, it's, and it's damaging, damaging individually and also to society. But it's not just games that are really bad at doing this as well. If we look at all of our cultural institutions, for instance, a recent report by the Arts Council revealed that the organisations we invest in are still not representative of the countries as a whole, and that's from the Arts Council themselves. I think it's really useful to step sideways and look at culture more broadly. And so if we consider museums, for instance, in a, re in, in a study... Uh, I think it was 2000 and in, t in a study that went back to 2000 and I think it's really useful to look sideways perhaps to in, in this case to museums if we consider culture in museums the material on display tended to confirm the stereotypical roles of disabled people in society despite finding evidence of disabled people being Teachers, coopers, miners, musicians, linguists, quilters, embroiderers, painters, naval commanders, collectors, sculptors, fundraisers, radiographers, nursing educators, politicians and merchants. And that's significant evidence and the evidence challenge, can challenge the expectation that disability must equal low contribution to society. So basically museums have got loads of great stories but they're failing to use them as well. And yet if we did use these stories, we'd start, the, culturally we'd, we would have quite a big impact by contesting reductive stereotypes, the report says, addressing the difficult stories surrounding disability history and demonstrating the diversity of disability experience. Museums have the capacity to challenge the understanding of what disability has meant to society in the past and could mean in the future. And I think that's a really interesting kind of conclusion. Why does it matter? Well, about 15% of the world's population have some form of, have some form of impairment and, and, and they're classified as being disabled. Many gamers are, uh, are now disabled and partly because the gaming population is getting older and also broader. Older people are playing games with their grandchildren, for instance. Legally, we have a lot to stand on. The United Nations which is a, a huge legislative fr uh, framework, has the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, of which the UK is a signature. And just to mention a key comment, it says state parties recognise the right that persons with disabilities take part on an equal basis with others in cultural life and shall take all appropriate measures to ensure that persons with disabilities enjoy access to cultural materials in all accessible formats. We're also protected, everybody in the UK is protected by the Equalities Act, which lists key protected characteristics which apply to everybody. But what holds us back is, is partly the, a history of inappropriate models and we can think of inspirational heroes that define us disability is done badly because these inappropriate models distort society's understanding of disability. Disabled people are not always inspiring, nor are their impairments the fault of, of their disability. Society chooses who to enable or disable. If we want to look for good examples, the British Council run 
an, a website called Disability Arts International. And there you can see fabulous work from around the world, but in particular the UK, where people are working with working on disability culturally in a fantastic and deep way. Do check that website out. I'm sure that you all remember Lost Voice Guy. I mean, he was just such a breath of fresh air. Completely mainstream, and yet this was new voice, new form of comedy, new attitude. I think it was really important to, to see that. So in my work, I try all sorts of your breath of fresh air. I'm primarily a digital artist, and I'm using my digital game skills and TV skills within a fine art context. I'm working with disabled people and utilising my lived experience of disability and, and I've produced work which has been seen around the world by millions of people. I work with disabled people and consider disability related narratives and try to use my digital skills to empower those works into the mainstream. These works can be quite abstract as in kind of all, all for Claire or Motion Disabled which I'll show you. All these works can be quite traditional yet still motion capture based as in ghosts. This is uh, part of the group, the group in Ireland that I work with to produce a major event. I work with topics around disability and here with Animex produ production manager. I work with topics connected to disability here with Animex project manager Tim Brunton I'm creating a work for Channel 4 called Ghosts. And Ghosts was a commemoration of World War One, which itself saw 15 to 21 million people worldwide impaired as a result of the war. So I'm utilising man, utilising knowledge from driver. I made the first motion capture work around disabled people and they're unique but still ordinary to their motions. Uh, this work was shown, showcased around the world including at the Smithsonian in Washington DC. Not only has it been shown in galleries, it's been projected large and as a result I became digitally quite skilled in large outdoor projection mapped events. In this case you can see an image from Cork Ignite which I produced with disabled artists in Ireland. To do that I worked with some of the most exciting event companies to deliver these massive scale spectacular works. To do the work though I make sure that the, the process of making the work is accessible and you, using multiple methods and I build inclusion in from the onset so the diversity feeds the work from the start. So as well as making the project accessible from the onset, I also make sure that it's ac it, the actual event is accessible. So with my production team, we always we implemented lots of methods to, for instance, audio description and so on to make sure that the event was accessible. And finally, we were able as a production team to pre present the work as the culminating event of Culture Night Ireland, which is a huge major Irish festival. So de doing disability well can also mean doing it well within the mainstream. Seven to 10,000 people uh, attended that event. My most recent sort of game related work includes one of the UK's most famous actors, Matt Fraser. And Matt was featured in American Horror Story, recently in His Dark Materials on the BBC. And Matt featured in some of my earlier work, including Motion Disabled, which you've seen, which I've showcased there. And chatting with Matt, we wanted, we both discussed, we'd have liked as children and adult, young adults to see a disabled lead character in a game. Now Matt is a thalidomide affected person which means that his, uh, he was damaged in the womb by medicine in the UK which was called um, it, by Matt is a thalidomide affected person and that means he was damaged in the womb by a drug called thalidomide. 
it was thought in the late 1950s and early 1960s that this was a safe drug, but it wasn't. And it affected thousands of children uh, across the world. And you can see that Matt is being born with arms that are shorter. So over a few years, I researched this story. <coughs> when I was born, I was born at home, delivered by a midwife who was shocked, <laughs> to say the least. I was given to my dad. Midwife explained no arms, no legs. I think he was quite gutted, obviously. I was born uh, with heart uh, deformities, which are um, quite common to people with a my disability. My uh, early days were spent in oxygen tent. So after I researched this project, some years later I created a plan for what would become a small endless run runner. And I made this project with a tiny team and it featured Matt and it also featured one of Matt's friends called Jackie Harbour. And in this particular game, you get to see Matt running round in an endless runner, but he also explores in a, in, in a quite a loose and small way the history of thalidomide. And Seal Boy launches later this year. So I think disability should be present in men's. Disability should be present in mainstream culture and we can ask why not we can ask is it so can we can ask UK games who are they supporting are they diverse are these games accessible As a member of the External Advisory Group on Equality, Diversity and Inclusion to UK Research and Innovation, I'm always asking how diversity can be supported better. Much of what I have talked about here applies to all aspects of diversity, gender, ethnicity, race, LGBTQ+. So disability underpins all aspects of life. And considering disability means considering all aspects of diversity. Why should we only tell one story? Ultimately, disability is an everyday experience. It's part of our social fact. Ultimately, disability is an everyday experience. It's part of our social fabric. It's not different or other. It's just ordinary. And that should be designer's starting point. We have a, can summarise the problems, disabled people and adults. We can summarise the problem, disabled children and adults are often excluded from games and gameplay. And I think large audiences, 
we can summarise the problems. Disabled children and adults are often excluded from games and gameplay. Large audiences are being lost as narratives appropriate to large sections of society are ignored. The economic cost of this is large. The disability gaze that leads to boring stereotypes and the dangerous psycho, the fixed superhero in a wheelchair, all lead to the portrayal of disabled people as other. And yet this is not a culturally rich and exciting approach. It's simply using lazy tropes. Finally, institutions are not doing enough to support equality, diversity and inclusion, despite their legal requirement to do so. Access is critical, and as individual and small studios can and do do a lot. Disabled children and adults need to see their own lives and history played out in games. And I think using the starting point of nothing about us without us kind of works from a design point of view. It could lead to a much richer experience. We can consider that new stories need to be developed, new innovative IP, different characters with depth. And using diversity as a resource and not a negative issue, not a negative issue can lead to really genuine deep characters. And I think we can argue, as I do within UKRI, that within multiple, multiple arenas, we can argue for sophisticated approaches to challenge these boring stereotypes. Borderlands feature, features Sir Alistair Hammerlock, and Hammerlock is a cyborg, which is often... Uh, Borderlands features Sir Alistair Hammerlock, and Hamlock is a really interesting character. He's gay, he's disabled, and, and in Borderlands, going back to Joe Parlock's comics, he says that he thrives, he isn't murdered, he's traumatised, he isn't a maniac, he just has grudges, family problems. In many ways, he's an ordinary person, and I think that's really interesting. He's a regular person with a regular story. To end, let's just do disability better. It's not just an access issue, it's a cultural issue. I just wanted to say thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to Animex 2021. Do check out my website and you'll find my email and so on there. And do enjoy the rest of the festival. Hello everybody, I'm Nikki Harper-Williams, also known as Talvi. Um, I am an accessibility advocate and a content creator. Um, I stream on Twitch, I take photographs, I do art, but mainly, most of all, I am, I am hard of hearing. Um, I am here today to do a short presentation, basically to talk about the accessibility of um, headphones, both um, in gaming headsets and general um, music use headphones um, and how they can apply to um, people that are setting up gaming events and vendors and various things like that. So let's get started, shall we? There we go. I also apologize for the cutscenes and I apologize for the music. You're currently using my stream setup, so it is what it is. So here's me and my mug. Um, this is um, accessibility in headphones um, and as you can see it's presented by yours truly. That is a picture of me holding headphones. I recently did a, a piece for um, Global um, Accessibility Awareness Day uh, with my friend Chris and uh, this is a screenshot he took of my morgue um, and I thought it would be hilarious to use it so here we go. <clears throat> So here we go, an introduction into a brief um, introduction about the topic of accessibility in gaming headphones and how event organisers could take the disability community into better consideration. Um, this has been a topic of mine that I've been really interested in for a really long time. Um, I lost my hearing in 
uh, around 2000 and I want to say about the 2000, 2001 point. Um, at that point, I was working in lots of loud pubs and nightclubs. And um, generally back then, we weren't given he um, hearing protection to protect our ears. And uh, I now have uh, a very severe case of tinnitus and uh, reduced hearing um, in both ears. Um, since wearing uh, ear um, hearing aids, um, I have discovered that the uh, use and design of headphones is uh, greatly impeding to people that wear hearing aids. And this is why I've become really interested in this subject. So I did a small survey on Twitter and these were the results. So this pie chart here shows the popularity of the different brands that are used across the disability community. HyperX and Logitech especially seem to be a common choice in gamers. Sennheiser EPOS came second place slot as was a popular choice for music listening. Other brands consisted of Sony, Skullcandy, Bose, aftershocks and disability devices such as subpack and the neck loop um, and like you can see by looking at the um, the pie chart the I only managed to um, survey 17 people uh, I was hoping to get a little bit more but time I was a bit crunched for time and so I did what I could but I got a fairly decent spread of results I find So why are these kind of brands popular um, and why do we feel that gamers um, and uh, music listeners um, verge towards these kinds of brands? So a little bit of survey feedback. Uh, the gamers in the deaf and hard of hearing community that were surveyed on Twitter gave consistent feedback that their headphones, excuse me, I've just had tea and I'm kind of burping my way through this, so I apologise if you can hear it. Uh, create that their headphones were either creating feedback with their hearing aids or that the hear headsets themselves were creating a large amount of pressure and causing their hearing aids to hurt their ears. This is purely because, uh, obviously we all know that hearing aids can be slightly different in design uh, but there generally is kind of like two basic designs of a hearing aid one that has the thicker tube and one that has the thinner tube uh, i personally use the ones with the thinner tube as i don't have ear molds um and this is because i have tinnitus and my doctor doesn't want me to block out any more noise than i've currently got going into my ears um but with the thin tubes, I find when there's an enormous amount of pressure on the tops of your ears, you find that the, the tube basically cuts into the top of your ears far more. And that can get very painful after a long period of time. So how can we move forward from this? Um, so clearly, the two issues with comfort and feedback seem to be repeating for the disabled gamers that I interviewed. As ever, there is hope for the future that designers will take such devices as hearing aids into consideration. I myself as a gamer and music consumer use two sets of headphones, a set of HyperX Cloud Alpha S for gaming, um, which are seen here in this lovely picture of my beautiful face, and a set of Bose QC235s for music. I'm a bit of a music connoisseur, as you can tell. That is how I lost my hearing. Too many loud um, venues, uh, too many loud gigs, too many loud bars, too many loud nightclubs. I've been a music fan since I can remember. And it was very important to me to have a really good set of headphones for music listening. Um, I've gone through many, many sets of headphones uh, many different brands. Um, I've used Steel Series, I've used Sony, I've used Sennheiser, and I've kind of settled on this kind of combination of HyperX and Bose for the time being, um, and I'm really happy with it. And these, yeah, these are very much my current favourites. So how can this data be used for gaming events? 
So data can be used in many different ways, but when looking at the usage of headphones in gaming events, it should be taken into consideration as to who exactly is using the headphones. If the deaf and hard of hearing community cannot use the headphones that you as a vendor have set out, this creates a large accessibility barrier to the community. And this is why you should be thinking about the uh, the community that you generally don't think about when sitting at headphones as a vendor because we're part of we're part of the larger gaming community it isn't just able-bodied people that can play games we all want to play games and we all want to be able to do it so this is this is me a little bit shouty being here but yes note in-ear headphones because generally these are not accessible to the deaf and hard of hearing gaming community although and obviously with the times of covid and things like this people are generally not um putting out ear in-ear headphones because of hygiene purposes and various things like this um but yes although the survey suggested otherwise. Out of the 17 people I, su I surveyed on the topic of headphone usage as a deaf and hard of hearing person, at least two people told me that they were an earbud user, although this meant removing their hearing aids to use them. The data shows that 11% 11 11 of the people surveyed were willing to sacrifice their hearing to have a more conventional and portable headphone method. This clearly shows that not everybody is willing to carry around a set of headphones in their bag. Um, so this is, so again, you should probably take into consideration uh, a comfort level for people. Some people are generally not going to be using headphones for uh, comfort reasons. Um, also as well, when considering people with autism and uh, sensibility issues, um, it's a case of sorry, sensitivity issues, not sensibility, apologies. Um, when considering these considerations as well, people generally don't like things on their head. My son has uh, sensitivity issues himself and really doesn't like headphones unless he gets to choose them. So can, please consider this as well. So yes, please keep us in mind, gamers generally come from all walks of life. It is no longer the scene of the average teenage boy, but a comfort to many. Disabled people are a part of that community, and when using headphones as part of your setup, please keep the deaf and hard of hearing community in consideration. I'm going to give a little bit of a shout out now to my friend Ben. So Ben Bayliss is a writer at Can I Play That? And Can I Play That is a very good source of online information for accessibility reviews. This concerns, and he recently did one concerning the Xbox wireless headset, which was recently released. He stated it's good and it's bad points, but the major issue was that the crystal clear chat only applied in other gamers hearing you and not the other way around, which automatically excludes most of the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, so we understand that xbox tried to do a really good thing here by trying to imply that crystal clear chat was going to be a thing but it's not clearly accessible to the deaf and hard of hearing community um and so that was a really that was kind of sad really i really wanted to see more of these headphones and i wanted them to be really good so it was kind of sad that that let them down a little bit um and that's it so thank you very much for listening um i'm just gonna quickly swap back over ba -ba -da. there we go thank you very much for listening that was greatly appreciated for your attention um as i said my name is nikki harp williams also known as tower v and if you wish to get a hold of me uh, my uh, Twitter handle is at Talvi Online and I would be happy to discuss more of this if possible. Thank you for listening and have a great day.